Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining in. I hope you all are doing well. Uh, good morning. A very good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> Wherever it is you are joining us from. Uh, good to see you. Welcome to our weekly mentoring hour. Uh, let's get started. Uh, can I request uh, one of our students to start us off with a word of prayer, please? If any of our students can uh, start us off with a word of prayer, that would be great. Go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Um, Heavenly Father, we just wish to thank you for this uh, hour of mentoring. And we pray, Father, that um, you'll help us learn uh, during this session and be able to apply whatever we've learned, Lord, in our daily lives, Father. We also pray that the Holy Spirit, our comforter and guide, Lord, will, will lead us into all truth, Lord. And we, we pray for a blessing upon our entire staff and all the students, Lord Jesus. And we ask you to be with us, Father, today, tomorrow, and in the days to come, Lord Jesus. In thy precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, all right. Uh, so this uh, morning we have uh, Pastor Nancy, who will be sharing uh, with us from the topic we all love. So, uh, Pastor Nancy, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Roshan. Good morning, everyone. It's just so good to be with uh, all of you and uh, talk on the subject of leadership. I know this is a subject that, uh, as Pastor Roshan mentioned, we all love the subject. And uh, throughout history, uh, people have tried to define what good leadership is all about. Uh, so this morning, I want to share a couple of insights, uh, primarily from the Word of God, so that uh, we know how um, the word of God suggests that we lead. So um, as we consider leadership, you know, many people have tried to define uh, leadership uh, coming from their own you know, spaces of work and experience. Uh, so th there are several definitions for leadership, uh, particularly um, you know, from the management space and uh, from the workspace. There are people who have said, um, that the only uh, definition of a leader is someone who has followers. Uh, that was by uh, Peter Drucker, uh, Oren Benes. He said leadership is the capacity to translate vision uh, into reality. Uh, Bill Gates uh, said, uh, as we look ahead into the next century, leaders will be those who empower others. Uh, John Maxwell, a very well-known leadership guru, uh, he uh, had gave us this quote. He said, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. So, you know, as we consider the various um, definitions and uh, interpretations of uh, leadership, I think it's uh, uh, important for us to uh, see what the Word of God has to say and learn from uh, the way Jesus led and the uh, leaders in uh, a scripture led uh, and uh, form our foundation from there. So I just want to share uh, a few insights and I hope that you know, you're able to see the screen which I'm sharing right now. Uh, are you able to see, uh, Pastor Roshan? Is that uh, visible? Yes, Pastor, we can see. Oh, okay, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, all right. So, um, so when we talk about leading, uh, leading with a vision is uh, key. Um, we know from the life of Jesus that uh, he was someone who understood his own purpose. Uh, right from the start till the end there was one thing that he never let go of and that was the mandate that uh, god gave him so jesus uh, uh, lived his life with a purpose uh, we know that even at a time when his heart was troubled in john 12 27 he says uh, now my soul is troubled and what shall i say father save me from the sap but for this purpose i came to the sap so as a leader we learn from jesus's life that uh, he knew his purpose and that gave so much clarity uh, for him to not just live out his life but also to lead uh, others 
So for us to be able to lead, uh, I think one thing that we learn from uh, the life of Jesus is to know our purpose, to pursue our purpose. Now, that is one thing at a personal level, uh, but for the people, Another very important aspect would be for us to uh, have a vision, a vision as uh, Proverbs 29:18 says, um, you know, where there is a vision, the people uh, cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. So uh, scriptures tell us that uh, where there's a, a vision, people have a focus and uh, they are able to uh, go about doing uh, what you know, they are meant to do. Now, a vision, we can talk so much about a vision, about how um, it energizes us and how it, um, you know, strengthens us uh, to keep moving forward. But for a leader, uh, it's uh, essential to have a vision or to receive a vision from God and uh, to be able to communicate clearly to the people. Now, there are so many other aspects to that you know, about uh, being able to um, set goals, being able to plan, organize. So there are various things, but uh, it all begins with a vision, uh, and that is important. So the first point that I wanted to make uh, uh, was that we must lead with a vision. Now moving on, uh, the second important uh, aspect for us to consider from God's word is uh, to be able to lead as a servant. Now we know uh, that uh, Jesus taught us this. He said that the Gentiles, uh, the rulers of the Gentiles, lord over them. Um, however, you know, he taught uh, the his people, his disciples, that whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. So servant leadership, uh, there is a lot that is talked about this uh, these days, not just in the Christian circles, but even in the uh, corporate uh, circles. Um, so leading as a servant, having a heart for the people, being concerned about the people uh, is uh, something that is uh, necessary. Uh, and for us as uh, spiritual leaders who are leading God's people, uh, to lead uh, with uh, humility is also very important. When we consider the life of Jesus as uh, you know, he led as a servant, we know Philippians chapter 2 tells us that uh, though uh, he is God, he humbled himself to become a man uh, and uh, he lived for the purpose that the Father called him um, for and uh, that's something that we can emulate to lead with uh, humility to uh, you know not not just lead for the sake of uh, i mean if uh, anyone wanted to lead uh, with uh, um, you know a grand title and a position that would be the lord jesus but he was willing to let go of uh, all that grandeur and be okay with uh, leading uh, as a human being and uh, really for us to learn from him to lead as a servant. Um, that's the second point that uh, I just wanted to make for us. Now, moving on, uh, the third uh, essential uh, aspect is to be able to lead uh, with uh, sacrifice. Uh, now, we know uh, even in the life of Jesus, uh, he he became obedient to God. He learned obedience. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 says, uh, through the many things that he suffered. So, uh, uh, there were, there were uh, so many challenges and difficulties that he had to wade through. Uh, and and uh, he was willing to do that. And so the example from the life of Jesus is that you know, he went the extra mile uh, in order uh, to lead uh, others. And so uh, that is something that uh, we can uh, uh, you know, take uh, from his life and know that uh, when we... Uh, when there is a leadership responsibility, there will be situations and times when uh, we may need to stretch ourselves uh, and uh, we may need to go the extra mile, we may need to you know, burn the midnight oil and do uh, uh, additional things uh, and even sacrificially and that's something uh, someone leading uh, must be ready to do, so leading with sacrifice. Uh, moving on, uh, the fourth aspect is to lead uh, as an example. Now, uh, uh, in this particular uh, um, 
passage that I have shared here from John 13, um, verses 12 to 15, we see that the Lord Jesus, he uh, washed the feet of his disciples and he told them to do likewise. So we see that he set uh, an example before them. Whatever he did, you know, he asked the others to do. So this again, even from the life of Paul, um, we understand that Paul was uh, the kind of leader who said, uh, you know, imitate me uh, as I imitate uh, Christ. So from uh, the life example, um, uh, you know, Paul was trying to lead people and so was Jesus. And so uh, that would be the right way for us to uh, set an example, for us to set the standards, for us to, um, you know, communicate the values, not just uh, through what we say, but uh, the way we live. Uh, and uh, that makes for a strong, uh, effective leadership. Uh, and the fifth uh, aspect that I, I want to uh, share is to uh, lead strong, leading strong. Now, leading strong, um, uh, this, this can cover uh, several um, aspects. However, the, the uh, focus that uh, I, uh, you know, the, that I want to bring the focus to uh, us being connected with God and being strong uh, in God. So for any leader, it's so important, and um, particularly a spiritual leader, it's so important for us to have a very strong relationship with God um, because you know Jesus is the true vine and we are the branches and the branch uh, is alive because it's connected uh, to the vine. The branch is fruitful because it's connected to the vine. And uh, if ever there is a disconnection, we know that that, uh, that is, is uh, cutting off life from the branch and, and it can't function. So uh, uh, with, with that in mind, you know, I, uh, I just want to state that being strong in the Lord is uh, so very important. Once uh, we find that position of strength in God, uh, everything else, uh, you know, will flow from there. Uh, and we see again from the life of Jesus that uh, he was so connected to God. He was obedient to God. He humbled himself and offered himself to uh, the purpose of God. We know about the intimate walk that Jesus had uh, with the Father. Uh, and so uh, for us to maintain that kind of strength in our relationship with God uh, will help us uh, navigate through uh, you know regular circumstances and particularly through uh, very very tough and uh, difficult circumstances so uh, uh, the personal strength uh, of a leader um, in god uh, as a person is is also uh, very important so uh, these five aspects are what i wanted to uh, leave before us um, for us to be able to lead uh, the way the word of god teaches us we must lead with a vision we must lead as a servant, we must uh, lead with sacrifice, uh, lead as an example, and lead strong. I uh, just want to quickly touch on uh, one uh, last aspect here. Uh, while we talk about leading and the attitude or the heart, the character uh, that a leader must have, uh, it's also important to understand that uh, uh, we must develop uh, abilities uh, to lead people. So I've just uh, listed out a couple of uh, abilities abilities here which are necessary. Um, the ability to be able to communicate the vision, as I stated earlier, and uh, to be able to um, you know, set goals, plan, organize, uh, execute well, be able to guide people as uh, we are journeying towards the vision. Uh, that is something that one um, can develop, uh, the ability to be able to work with people, because leading is about uh, working with people. So the ability to work with people, the ability to work with teams uh, is uh, necessary, uh, the ability to be able to nurture and develop uh, other leaders uh, among us to raise up other leaders is is uh, required uh, the ability to be able to make good decisions uh, because there'll be uh, so many occasions when you know uh, the right decision needs to be made and in a timely manner so the ability to be able to do that uh, is important uh, for leading um, to be able to serve with excellence to be able to serve with integrity um, uh, and uh, you know, to know that uh, one must pursue a growth 
uh, and development grow, keep growing as an individual keep growing uh, in in you know our capacities our, our knowledge our experience abilities um, and finally to be able to uh, rise above uh, challenging circumstances and situations so uh, those are some um, you know key insights that I wanted to share, but I'm sure, you know, there's an ocean of uh, information that, you know, we can uh, consider when we talk about leadership. So with that, uh, I just hand it over, uh, hand it back to uh, Pastor Lotion. Thank you so much. Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Nancy, uh, for those wonderful insights on leadership, as I mentioned on the topic that we all love. Uh, so before we continue uh, with the questions on leadership, before we start taking questions on leadership, uh, I just wanted to address one question that was posted uh, last week um, during Pastor Jake's uh, session. And uh, Pastor Jake, uh, if you're there online, please feel free to respond to this question. This was a question from Lucy. Um, so after this question, we will uh, begin to address questions on leadership, if that's okay. And so keep your questions ready. All right, so this was the question. Um, how do we overcome the comments of people which hurts us. Moreover, it runs in our mind for days and sometimes we even wait to answer them back. How do we fight such situations? I'll read that question one more time. How do we overcome the comments of people which hurts us? And moreover, it runs in our mind for days and sometimes we wait to answer them back. In other words, we wait to retaliate, I guess. So how do we fight such situations? Um, Pastor Jakes, if you are there, would you like to respond to that question? Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm not able to, to turn on the camera. I'm just trying to speech. So yeah, um, uh, the, uh, like I, I'll just give my personal um, you know, strategy for doing this. Uh, it would be to you know take it to the Lord first and foremost. Obviously, words have hurt us. Um, uh, you know, maybe because uh, the words were critical or words were angry or words were judgmental, whatever, it has hurt us deeply. So the first thing is to uh, take it to the Lord, you know, take it before the Lord and say, Lord, you know, uh, I just bring this hurt to you. I am hurting. So bring it to acknowledge that yes, we are hurting. Bring it to the Lord. And, um, and if there is any um, you know, even if there's a small percentage of truth to what the person has shared, you know, uh, taking away the emotion, maybe it was said in an angry manner, maybe it was said in a very hurtful manner, but if there is any truth to what was being said, um, you know, uh, as, as a you know, saying that, okay, this needs to change in me, you know, we take that and work with it. So there is truth to it. And, um, and then lay aside the other things. Right. Lay aside the other things and take it before the Lord, and even pray for the person. Like uh, you know, bring the person before the Lord and speak a word of blessing of the person, and pray for the person, and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to heal our hearts. Right? Sometimes it's uh, you know the the truth hurts. Right? Maybe the person has spoken truth, uh, and uh, we are convicted, and that hurts. You know, so it could be that also. So. Um, so uh, I would personally do this and, uh, and allow the Holy Spirit to heal whatever areas in my life that needs healing. Uh, I would allow the Holy Spirit to you know, heal. And uh, yeah, I, I know that the, 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 the time factor involved, you know, uh, the thing is to take it before the Lord immediately, not to, not to let things fester, not to let things, you know, not, not to wait to be in the mood to take it before the Lord, but to really take it before the Lord immediately. Um, because we know, you know, uh, in Proverbs we read about how we need to guard our heart uh, with all diligence, because out of it uh, flows the issues of life. So we need to work with it immediately. Like how, if we would, you know, if we uh, fall down and if, we, if there's a cut, we would immediately, you know, look into it, wash it and you know, do something about it. The same way we do this so that uh, we can function well, and we can be a blessing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Pastor Jakes. Uh, if any of our uh, faculty members would like to add into that, uh, feel free to, or we'll continue. OK. 
Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Pastor Jakes, once again for that. Uh, Lucy, I hope that answered your question. Uh, so just to connect uh, that question to today's topic, once again, um, maybe this question is for you, Pastor Nancy, and just to start things off. Uh, so one of the abilities of leadership, say, is that we uh, leaders can receive constant feedback. Um, it could be critical feedback, constructive feedback, uh, let's say critical for the most part. Um, so um, how have you handled um, critical feedback or uh, yeah, something negative? And how have you responded um, in your journey as a leader so far? OK, thank you, Pastor Roshan. That's a hard question right at the start of our, uh, you know, uh, this, this session. Uh, yes, there have been um, a tough uh, tough comments and some critical feedback that I received, uh, um, you know, over the course of ministry and even otherwise, right? Like we, we receive it in um, various other aspects of our life. So uh, in my case, uh, I would say that uh, I've learned to consider critical feedback as uh, something that's very valuable because uh, you know sometimes there are blind spots things about ourselves that we are not aware of uh, and it's so helpful when somebody points uh, something out uh, to us so uh, i learned this someplace uh, receive feedback with your mind uh, but uh, give feedback with your heart so i try to do that so i receive that feedback and then i try to um, uh, uh, you know assess whether uh, where they're coming from, why are they saying this, is there something that I've missed, uh, and if I have, then, uh, you know, uh, I it's painful, it's definitely painful, but then uh, I just pray that, okay, God, help me change, uh, help me, uh, you know, develop myself in this area, um, and, and so, yeah, that's that's how I do it, and that's how I've uh, done it, or I'm trying to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, any of the other faculty would like to add to or respond to that same question? Okay. All right. Feel free to jump in anything. Uh, all right. So we have a question from, uh, I believe that's Kennedy, uh, right? I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the question here says, kindly expand more on the abilities to handle challenges. Kindly expand more on the abilities to handle challenges. Sure. Uh, yes, I'll share my thoughts and uh, you know, the time is open. Uh, our other faculty could also please share your views. So um, expanding our ability to handle challenges, I think the way we one can do it uh, is firstly with wisdom. Uh, and so to really seek God for his wisdom in a tough situation. Um, and, uh, you know, we know that when we pray, we uh, ask God, he leads us in, in various ways. Uh, uh, you know, we, we may be inspired by the Holy Spirit. We may receive some ideas uh, to, uh, you know, deal with that uh, situation. So that is one thing. But uh, also depending on wise counsel from people who have gone before us, uh, particularly, you know, in, in um ministry we uh, are connected to godly people and you know elders so it's uh, good to um, good to speak with them good to ask questions and uh, for suggestions uh, and uh, you know when we receive counsel uh, i'm sure we'll be able to address the matter uh, in in the best way possible so uh, two two things there thank you Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, Kennedy, do you have a follow-up question uh, to ask? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, great. Uh, once again, I'd just like to remind our faculty that uh, at any time, if you would like to pitch in, uh, add in, uh, feel free to unmute and uh, share. All right. Uh, great. Uh, going on to the next uh, uh, question we have from Rin and Pastor Ashish, it's uh, directly addressed to you. Uh, how do you keep yourself in that place of humility, even as your ministry has grown? And uh, how have you handled the rumors that you may hear about your teachings? Um, 
Okay, thanks, Ren, for the question. Um, uh, yeah, it's happening. These cameras are coming on. Okay. Um, okay. Just pretend I'm there. I can see everybody else. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, just two quick things when we talk about staying in a place of humility. Two or three things um, that come to mind right away. Uh, one is. Um, uh it's that awareness that uh this is god everything is happening because of, of god doing it rather than me right or, or us as a, as individuals mm. yes god has given each one of us as individuals certain grace a certain gifts and we're all you know each one of us have been designed by god uh with certain strengths um, but even that is a gift from God. And uh, uh, everything that's happening is happening because of God. Right? Uh, and we can, you know, we can reference many scriptures, Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3, Paul says, uh, you know, uh, 3, uh, verse 6 as well, it says, uh, you know, one man can sow, another man can water, but it's it's God who gives the increase. So just con being aware that everything we have is given to us from God, you know, and and, and John the Baptist says this in John 3, uh, he says, no, a, a man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven, right? That means everything we have has been given to us from God. Just keeping that, being aware, that awareness, we never lose that awareness that everything has come from God. It's unto Him. Uh, and I like to pray that prayer in Psalm 115, you know. Uh, and I like to go to that prayer, especially when something big happens. I purposely go to Psalm 115, verse 1, not unto us, O God, not unto us, but to Thy name be glory. You know, that means all the glory of this thing, you know, whatever big thing may have happened, you may have had a big meeting or a big crusade or whatever. You go, I, go, I like to go back and just mention, Lord, not to us, not to us, but to thy name be glory. So that one awareness, being living in that place of awareness that it's nothing. We are, we are nothing. It's all from God. Secondly, uh, I, I like to remind myself that the place of humility is the place of grace. Uh, and, and you see this in scripture. Um, uh, James and Peter, they write, you know, that God gives more grace to the humble. You know, so if we want to do big things, we need more grace. But how can we receive more grace by becoming more humble? Right? Or if you want to go up higher, uh, you need more grace to stay in that higher place. How can you receive more grace to stay in the higher place? Yeah, you have to step down lower. So really in the kingdom, if you want to go up higher, you have to first step down lower because when you step down lower, God gives you more grace and that's the grace that helps you stay in the high place. So I remind myself that, you know, it's the grace of God that's going to keep us as we move up higher and higher. And just one third thing is, uh, I, I, I like to look forward rather than look at the past or even look at the present. You know, so I, when you look into the future, like Nancy just spoke about having a vision. That means a vision is I'm looking forward, I'm not looking backward. I'm looking ahead. I, I, you know, if, 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 if example, I'm just giving using some numbers just to, you know, quantify this. Suppose you uh, you have a congregation, of, let's say you're ministering to a thousand people. You, you're looking forward. You're saying, God, my vision is to impact one million people. That means this thousand is still like um, very minuscule compared to the, the vision ahead. Right? That means when you keep looking forward, you're not going to take pride in the present or in the past. And you know, it's going to say, hey, whatever, whatever has happened is almost nothing compared to what is yet to be done. And, and that's, that's the way God, God is leading us forward. He's not you know, causing us to live. So don't live in the past. And you know, I, I'm saying this with a pinch of salt. Don't live in the present. I mean, you're not bloating over the present. You're, you're kind of looking in the future and saying, God, there's still work to be done. You know, there are still so many souls to be saved. So, so these three simple things uh, help us, I think. Stay in that place, so give me a Um, your next question is How do you how have you handled the rumors that you may hear about your teachings? Rin, if you've heard any rumors, please let me know. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, yeah, so I think somebody had asked a question earlier about uh, criticism. 
See, one is uh, I don't. Um, one is I don't spend my time listening to what people have to say. Now, again, understand it in context. Uh, I do listen to people who are giving feedback, who are, you know, are telling us, you know, we can do things better and so on. So, but I do listen to that. But I'm not interested in reputation. I'm not even interested in people like my sermon or not. Hey, if you don't like my sermon, you've got plenty of other options. Right? So, because for me, the issue is I, I'm not here, I'm not living by people's applause. I'm not living by how many likes I, I, I don't, I'm not on social media. I don't care how many likes I got or, uh, you know, how many thumbs up I got. I, I don't, none of those things bother me. I don't waste my time on that. Those are frivolous things. So, uh, so basically, I don't give space uh, to listen to gossip, to listen to what people have to say. Uh, I, I don't waste my time on it. But I am very open to genuine feedback, which comes from you know people around us, congregation, and so on. But out there, when people are just gossiping, that's a waste of time. I don't even engage in it. Now, now and then, uh, some things might accidentally reach my ears. <laughs> Where, uh, or sometimes some people directly send me emails uh, criticizing something. And uh, I think like, uh, like Nancy already said, uh, the thing is we look at it very objectively. I think Nancy or Bostek, I'm not sure. Somebody shared, um, we look at it very objectively. Like, if, is, is there any merit in what people are saying about our teaching or preaching? Uh, if there is merit, yeah, pay attention to it. But if it's coming out of a place of their bias, now obviously a person from a purely evangelical perspective, and I've had that, I've had some people call me and scold me on the phone for you know talking about the supernatural or revival or those kinds of things. And I've had those kinds of things happen, but then I know where they're coming from. They're coming from a persuasion that does not have space for the supernatural or the revival. So I just listen to it and I, I don't bother responding because I'm, you know, God is our defender. As long as we keep our heart and hands and uh, mind clean, and we know we're doing the right thing, we just go on. So uh, I'll just close by quoting what the Apostle Paul said, and he said this in two places: in Acts uh, 23, verse one, uh, and as, as well in Acts uh, 20. I forget uh, the other reference, but he said, you know, I live in all good conscience or in clear conscience before God and man. That means. My conscience is clean before God, before man, so that I'm not affected by these, uh, you know, I, 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 whatever people say. I don't live for it, therefore, I'm not affected by it. Hope this helps you. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Um, that was awesome. Um, all right. Uh, thanks again, uh, Rin, for those questions. Uh, let's move on to the next question we have from Sam. A uh, few words of appreciation. Yeah, uh, like I said, everybody loves this topic. Uh, so the question from Sam is uh, how to balance between delegating, assigning, and letting go, allowing people to make mistakes and learn from mistakes, even at the sake of compromising on the quality, timeliness, etc., versus doing everything by yourself as a leader, waiting patiently for your team to be more proactive and take roles more readily that's uh that's a packed question uh right there so pastor we can start off with you pastor nancy and then uh probably bring in uh, the faculties as well sure uh thank you pastor Roshan, and uh, thank you uh, sam for that question uh how do we balance okay delegating and then doing things ourselves so uh I, I would look at it as uh, you know some th this needs to be an intentional decision uh, because uh, I, I talked about the ability to be able to uh, develop leaders to nurture uh, leaders raise them up so with that intention in mind you know one would need to make the decision uh, about uh, you know not doing everything by themselves but you know, having others uh, come uh, come alongside um, now. Uh, one is that you know intentionally we will have to do that at some point but uh, at which point uh, you know should we do that that's uh, your question more specifically uh, i think again there sam we really need the wisdom of god uh, to know the right time to have people uh, 
come in. Um, now, maybe one practical thing is uh, like when uh, a ministry or a task, uh, we, we're beginning with that, it may be good to bring it to a certain uh, certain um, structure, establish the process, uh, the systems, uh, or, or at least be able to you know, draft out the, the vision for that uh, and have some clarity. Uh, and you know, once those things are in place, it, it might be easier to bring people on to communicate clearly to them, you know, what needs to be done by them and then set a, a, a right expectation. And from that point on to be able to work with people. So yeah, uh, that's what I wanted to share. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Natsi. Um, right, would uh, anyone else like to add to it, please? Pastor Jakes or even Pastor Ashish, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, just some thoughts here on this. Uh, I think one is, um, uh, remember, uh, like uh, Nancy said, um, part, of our part of leadership, of course, is to develop others, right? Uh, a good leader is always looking at developing others. Uh, but then understand that developing is a process. Uh, and so uh, when we want to develop people, we need to create a safe space for them where uh, they know that whatever has been given to them is a safe space and uh, they can make their mistakes and their slowness uh, in doing something uh, is not going to be detrimental to the overall picture. Like, so, so I think uh, as a leader, part of that is being judicious on what you delegate and what you don't delegate and who you delegate to, right? So that's the response of a leader. You, we have to have that, uh, you know, we can call it as part of our emotional intelligence. That is, I've got five things to do. What are the things I need to do myself? What are the things I can delegate? But who should I delegate to? And I know their capacity. And, and I have creating them a safe space so that they can do it. And it will not impact the overall result. So that's the emotional intelligence of a leader. That means you're understanding the people you're working with. You're knowing whom to delegate, what to delegate, and you know the level of expectation. So example, right? Suppose I have five tasks, that uh, things that need to be done. Uh, I may be able to do all five of them in one day, which is fine. I can do it. But you know, my time is more important than doing these five tasks. I need to use my time for other important things, which other people may not be able to do. So um, maybe two of these tasks are things that I absolutely need to do, that things that only I can do because maybe only I have the information to, to make those decisions. Others don't have the information. So I have to do those two things. The other three I can delegate. But the question is, I need to have the emotional intelligence to know whom to delegate to, right? So let's just for the sake of example, let's say there are two people who could do this. One is at a more of an, a, you know, a junior level. Another person is has a little bit more experience, maybe a little bit more competency. So I distribute these three tasks among those two people, right, the other three. Uh, and I know that person A may take five days to do it. I know their task. Another person, whereas I could actually do that task in half an hour, but they're going to take it, you know, whatever time. Uh, but I'm willing to give them that time because I want them to learn. I want them to develop. And they have a safe space. It's okay for them to take five days. It's not going to overall impact the overall outcome of where the organization is going. The other two tasks I can give to person B, who might take three days to do those tasks. I may be able to do those tasks in half an hour. But I'm giving that safe space of three days for person B to do it. Again, even if that person takes three days, it's not going to impact the overall outcome. Right? And the person is going to learn in the process. So that's the intelligence of a leader where you're saying, I know I can do all these tasks very quickly, but my goal is to develop other people. I also know other people's, their level of competency, how long they will take to do this. And you know, I know that even if they do take this time or they make these mistakes, it's not going to affect the overall where we're going. And so based on that, we delegate. So you know, we don't randomly delegate things. Uh, we don't delegate for instance, it's at random or arbitrarily. There's, a, there's intelligence behind it. You're looking at 
uh, developing people, we're looking at creating a safe space for the various people, depending on which levels they are, their competencies. Uh, and you're also looking at the overall impact on what the organization or the ministry needs to achieve. And then based on that, you're distributing the tasks. And then in the process, you're giving feedback. And you know, of course, you've got to be patient. You, when you're giving feedback, you know that, hey, I could actually have done this in half an hour, but I've given it to this person. I, the purpose is I'm waiting for them to develop. And you know that's how the journey is, happens. And then you, you, you evaluate and you grow. So, yeah, hope that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. For responding to that question okay uh, let's move on uh, we have a question from Radha uh, how do you handle harsh words or sometimes rudeness in front of people yes uh, pastor would you like Raja to expand or elaborate on that question that's also fine so yes uh, yes please uh, rudeness in front of people I'm just trying to understand is it the leader being rude or the people being rude to the leader Right, uh, Raja, could you uh, please respond to that or elaborate on the question, please? Please feel free to unmute and speak. Okay, uh, Pastor, while we wait for him, uh, to, for Raja to respond, would you like to like, answer that from a particular perspective? As in... Okay, um, I, I, uh, if it is about, you know, uh, a leader being harsh, uh, I think the Word of God teaches us that we must speak the truth in love. So, uh, you know, we, yes, there, there are points where we have to hold people accountable and, uh, uh, you know, we must uh, communicate the truth uh, so that uh, there is a change, be very firm. Uh, but uh, that's different from, you know, being harsh or being very careless, uh, using hurting words. And that is something uh, uh, a leader shouldn't do. Um, now, uh, if people are rude to us, uh, I think as uh, Pastor shared earlier, um, you know, we, we must just take it very objectively, uh, maybe uh, keep our peace, hold, uh, uh, be calm at that time uh, and assess objectively, you know, what's going on. And if there, there is uh, something um, that we need to uh, respond with, you know, maybe we can uh, come back once the situation has calmed down, you know, come back and address it. So those are, those would be my thoughts. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, so Jeffina has a question. Uh, so as a leader, when we make wrong moves, it eventually hurts uh, others who follow you, uh, and that position you uh, and and the positions you in a place of guilt and hurt. So if uh, ever a leader makes a wrong move due to their weakness, how can a leader move forward? Yes. Yeah, I'll uh, go ahead and share some thoughts. Uh, so, Jafina, I, I think making mistakes is a part of uh, growing up. Uh, and even as a leader, making mistakes, uh, that's something that is unavoidable. Uh, at some point or the other, mistakes do happen uh, un unintentionally, uh, you know, hopefully. But then uh, the important thing is to recognize those mistakes, to seek forgiveness from God, and uh, to be able to, you know, seek uh, forgiveness from people uh, who are involved. Uh, and to, uh, you know, at, at the, from that point onwards, once we have um, uh, sought forgiveness and try to resolve that matter to um, again rise up and keep moving because you know you can't do anything about what has already happened um, and so you know we we will need to be strong enough and move on and try to make better decisions uh, in the future but uh, having said that I, I also want to say that as leaders um, uh, we have to be so careful uh, not to make any mistakes because uh, it concerns people, it concerns many lives. And so uh, we really need the grace of God and the wisdom of God to, um, you know, uh, 
walk in such a way and make such decisions that will be a blessing to the people. So uh, we don't want any mistakes to happen, but if they do, then uh, we we can uh, resolve it. Um, you know, rise up and uh, keep moving forward. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Kofi, I see that you have raised your hands. We'll uh, get to you as soon as we uh, you know, respond a few questions in the chat section, and then we have five more minutes to do that. Uh, but anyway, so let's go. Um, so another question here from Jafina is, uh, what would be the three important things that a leader must never do? <laughs> uh, I think I'll open it up to the other leaders on the group okay. here. All right. Yes, uh, Pastor Ashish, Pastor Jay Kumar, uh, Smitha. Greetings. Hey, my, my top three things, uh, I'm sure others will have other things, but uh, my top three things is one is uh, the leader must never take credit uh, for what the team has accomplished. Yeah, so. When the team has done something that leaders should never stand up and say, I did it, that's terrible. Uh, <laughs> it should always be, we did it, or just give credit to the team. Uh, and the leader should be willing to just go unnoticed. You know, uh, So a leader who, who's willing to go unnoticed uh, is, is a great leader. Yeah. Say, hey, the team did it, let them be in front. I, I don't need anything. That's a great. So first is, a leader should never take credit for what the team accomplished. Uh, second, uh, I think a leader should uh, never uh, insist on their own way when others are not aligned. Right? That means if, uh, if I, uh, if, if example, like let's take if we can, it, it, it can take, we can take it in one on one in, in a situation where if somebody doesn't want to do something, don't insist that they should do it. Uh, in in a leadership situation, I mean, as a parent, you can do that with your baby child, <laughs> but you can't do that in in the workplace, right? At, at home, you can say, "Dad said it, go do it." You can't do that in the workplace, uh, in the in the, in the ministry. So don't force your don't override some. Uh, and let me put it like this: don't override somebody else's somebody else's will. You always share what's right, and hopefully they do it. And the last thing I would say, the third thing I would say, uh, is a leader should never manipulate, uh, especially in the Christian context, we could actually use God's word, or we can actually use the anointing to control people. We can say the Holy Spirit told me, you know, we could say, we can take chapter and verse and say, hey, you have to do this. That's actually spiritual manip manipulation. It's equivalent to witchcraft. So a Christian leader could actually be practicing witchcraft if they're using God's word anointing to control people. That's spiritual manipulation. So these are top, my top three things which a leader should never do. I'll leave it open to the others. Others may have other things. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Pastor Nancy, would you like to add to it? or? Um. Well, I, I agree with Pastor. So I'm still trying to think of you know what would be my top three things. Uh, yeah. Fine. I, I think I'll just let that go. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Due to time, uh, we'll just take one more question, probably, and we'll respond to the rest uh, later. Uh, we have another question from Kennedy. Um, as a leader, how to handle the element of hatred in the church setup that affects growth? How to handle hatred, element of hatred in the church setup that affects growth? Okay, um, I'll, I'll just share. Uh, so element of hatred, so Kennedy, I'm understanding this as uh, there are people who, um, you know, who uh, are against the leadership or who who um, you know, create some sort of a discord or division among the people. So as a leader, I think uh, one should be very, very alert uh, in the first place to not let such, such a thing um, you know, uh, exist at all. So at the first instance of noticing some uh, such discord or division, 
the leader needs to take action immediately to address it. Otherwise, what will happen is uh, it will it will grow, it will fester, uh, and it will uh, you know really destroy the church. Uh, as you know, you've also mentioned the word uh, affect the growth of the church. It will uh, affect the uh, growth of the church. So a leader must act um, uh, very wisely and quickly in such matters. Thank you. Great. Um... Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, questions that were not answered, we will respond to it. Um, and uh, but, but thank you for posting it in, uh, Pastor Nancy. Thank you so much for this wonderful session today, and uh, and all the other faculty for joining in, and also the students. Thank you, and I will see you again next week. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.